our We Need to Talk topic is, is looking at the idea of how do I keep my faith in this culture? How do I keep my faith in this culture? And, and uh, looking at the idea of how do we walk out our faith in a culture that constantly pushes an agenda of pride, of greed, of self-satisfaction, and ultimately a culture that tells us that we don't need God. So as we dive into today's message, would you bow your heads and pray with me? God, thank you for giving us this time this morning uh, to receive your message. God, I pray that, uh, that you would speak through this, that, that my words would fall away, God, and that your Holy Spirit would speak to us in ways that we can step out in faith in our culture, God, and we can live into the, pe- the people that you're calling us to be. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So like I said, the topic for today is asking this question, how do I keep my faith in this culture? And, and when I say this culture, uh, I, I'm referring to the prominent culture in America uh, that focuses on building up our own kingdom, uh, that has drawn many people in our country uh, away from godly communities. And, and we live in what I would consider uh, to be the outcome of a society that was obsessed with the American dream, uh, obsessed with the idea that we can have whatever we want, we just have to work for it. And we're surrounded by the narrative that uh, we should be able to get what we want when we want it, um, if we just work for it. And, and we're told to strive for whatever is pleasurable told to, to build up our portfolios and told to get what we want at almost any expense, right? And, and a study was done uh, in 2019 by a well-known research firm in America. And uh, so right before the COVID pandemic started, this, this study was done in, in America. And it, it showed that in the past decade, uh, adults in America who identify as Christian has gone down 12%. And, and more importantly, more, more important statistic that I, I found in this study is that one in four adults in America, one in four adults in America identify as agnostic, atheist, or nothing in particular, with nothing in particular being the largest group by far out of um, those three. Uh, but what breaks my heart is that it's easy to look at uh, statistics and numbers and be like, dang, that stinks. That is really a bummer. Uh, but what breaks my heart is that behind every number, behind every statistic is a real, breathing, living human, um, and, and in this case, a human that doesn't no, Jesus. And, and even more so, uh, would say, eh, there's nothing in particular that I believe, really. And, and what I hear behind the statement of, there's nothing in particular that I believe, uh, what I hear that person saying is, well, there's so many voices in our world telling me what to believe and what to not believe. Uh, there's so many things on my to do list, so many people I need to connect with, so many issues I need to attend to, so many tasks to finish that when it comes to thinking about my beliefs or, or my faith about God, well, nothing in particular, really. And I could be up here for a while, right, unpacking stats and information about the state of our culture's view on God, but I don't want that to be the focus of today. And I think most of us are already aware, in some extent, of uh, the impact in our culture that has uh, drawn people away from God or, or distracted us um, from the main purpose of life. Uh, but what I do want to be the focus today is how, as people who are, are following after Jesus, how can we faithfully serve God in a culture that tells us that we don't necessarily need him? So what I want to look at and what I want to do is, is break down in a way that's going to be useful and applicable to each and every one of our lives um, how we can live out our faith in a society that uh, at some times tells us that we don't need God, that we can do it on our own. So in order to do that, I condense the calling that God has on each and every one of our lives into, into three things. And I pulled these three things from, uh, one, Jesus' response to what the greatest commandment was, and, and two, uh, the great commission that Jesus gave to his uh, followers as he was about to leave earth. So the three, uh, three pillars that I'm going to look at today of how we can love God, love people, and make disciples, and how we can do those three things in a way that uh, engages with our culture, but also uh, affects our culture in a positive manner. So these three things that are Jesus' thoughts on the greatest commandment and from the Great Commission, like I said, he gives to these to his disciples. So as I break these down, uh, we're going to look at how we as followers of Jesus can step into a culture that might be drifting away from God and create positive and impactful change in our communities, in our friendships, in our families, in our schools. Um, and, and as disciples, we'll see how the presence of God is still at work and how we can make meaningful impact in our communities. So uh, I want to unpack first of the idea of how we can love God in a way that engages a culture that might be drifting away from him. So to do that, I want to uh, go to a, a verse in, or a moment from Jesus' ministry. It's at the beginning of his ministry, and uh, you probably have heard this story before, but if not, 
we're in Matthew 4, and in Matthew 4, 1, there's this instance towards the beginning of Jesus' ministry. He's preparing to go out and do all the wonderful things that he was going to do. And before he did that, uh, he's led into the wilderness by the Spirit, it says. It says, then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And while Jesus is in the wilderness, the, the devil tests him by offering him food when Jesus is fasting and hungry. He tempts Jesus by telling him to test God by putting himself in danger. And he, he tempts Jesus by saying, hey, I'll give you every kingdom under, the, under your eyes. I'll give you all the power on earth if you would just bow down to me. He, he tests him and he tempts him with these things of the world. And Jesus responds and he responds with, with truth. And when he's faced with these temptations, he responds with words like, Hey, it is, it is written, man should not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. And then he says, it is written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. And then he's like, it is written, worship, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And in the face of being tempted by, by power and, and indulgence and testing God, Jesus responds with truth uh, that allows his love for the Father to overflow from his heart into his words and his actions. And it, we're, it, it's likely that we're not being led into the wilderness and to be tested by the devil where he's like, hey, you want me to turn this rock into a piece of bread? That's probably not happening for us today. But the reality is that in our lives, in, in our culture, there are things uh, that mirror the, the tests that Jesus withstood because in our culture, we're, tested to, we're tempted to uh, give in to anything that brings pleasure or, or indulge ourselves on things that are pleasurable. Uh, we're tempted to uh, test God in a manner that uh, says, hey, I'm going to push God's grace as far as I can. I'm going to do whatever I can to manipulate God's grace. And we're tempted to do that sometimes. And also when it comes to the idea of, of worshiping the Lord your God and serving him only, we could point to a, a thousand different things that are, are temptations to become idols in our life, right? Uh, so in our world today, these are still things that we're tempted with. There's still things that we're faced with in our in our culture, and, and unfortunately, our culture almost advertises those things as, as good. Um, so it's easy to get caught up in that culture and, and find yourself wasting your whole life fighting for power and, and building up your own kingdom. So something I was reminded of uh, when I was thinking about this idea of, of living out our faith uh, in a world by loving God, uh, I thought of a phrase that's it's kind of a cheesy Christian phrase uh, in some circles, but I think there's a lot of truth behind it, and you may or may not have heard uh, this phrase before, but you see it right here. It's be in the world, not of it. And, and what that means for followers of Jesus is that we're not meant to be some secluded country club where we, where we retreat off and we gather, and uh, we only talk with the insiders, and then, uh, well, we go back into the world, and we're like, oh, this is the world. This isn't, this isn't people that I associate myself with. And uh, it's easy to become like a secluded country club, but rather we're meant to be parts of a diverse and vibrant communities with people from all different walks of life coming together, knowing that we all need Jesus, that no matter our socioeconomic status, our, our race, our uh, background, how we grew up, uh, we all get to come to the community that needs Jesus equally. And, and it all might sound good and well when we think about that, but I know uh, the reality is for a lot of us when uh, we're faced with uh, being around people who don't think like us or, or talk like us or look like us, it's uncomfortable. Uh, it's a natural reaction to those situations. Um, it, it's uncomfortable to be in those sort of situations. So I want to break down for us what this phrase, be in the world, not of it, can actually look like, right? Uh, so you may or might not know this about me, but I'm a huge coffee person. Uh, and I always give Nathan a hard time because there's been times in his sermons or just when he's talking in conversation where he'll be like, oh, I had this coffee awakening. I found out there was caramel macchiatos and, and white chocolate mochas. And I always give him a hard time. Like, I'm like, bro, those are like, I would eat those for dessert maybe sometimes. Like, uh, there's so much sugar in those, I could probably make a cake out of it or something. Um, but I, I love coffee. And I, I, if you were to go over to my house, I have a whole part of my counter that uh, is for my coffee making process. And I buy these single origin beans that have different tasting notes. And it's really particular. And I have an electric kettle where I pour over exact measurements on a scale. And I, I grind the beans in my house. It's really extra, uh, so I'm not saying you have to do that, but it's awesome. Um, so if you ever want to try a, a cup of my coffee, feel free to uh, come over and I'll make you a cup. But um, I say that because uh, as I was thinking about this idea of being in the world, not of it, I thought of, of a coffee shop because a coffee shop is somewhere I like to go a lot of times uh, to do work or, or hang out with friends or just like catch a vibe, you know? Um, so I, I go to coffee shops a lot. And, 
Uh, one thing, if you've been to coffee shops before, you know that uh, there's a lot of hustle and bustle that can happen, right? There's people making coffee, the espresso machines shooting out steam. Um, there's people opening and closing doors, people talking, the workers are scrambling around, and it gets noisy and chaotic sometimes. And, and it becomes this place where it's kind of hard to focus. Um, but there's this awesome thing. Uh, because of modern technology, there's noise-canceling headphones. And uh, when I was in middle school, uh, the, the big noise-canceling headphones were the Beats. We would wear the big Beats around. We would walk into school and think we're the baddest around because we had Beats on. Uh, but, but thanks to modern technology today, now they're just these tiny little things. Um, and the new Apple AirPod Pros, they're sweet. Um, the, you can be sitting in a coffee shop, and you put these little bad boys in your ear, and whoosh, silence. And it's awesome. Um, like, my girlfriend has a pair of them. And uh, sometimes if I'm talking too much at a coffee shop, it's just and uh, she won't have to listen to me talk. And some of you guys just got really big eyes. You're like, Adam, I need the link to that. I was like, I need the link to that. Whenever my kids are annoying me or my husband's talking too much, I need those. Um, but they're awesome, right? You, you can be in a, a place that's chaotic. You can be in a place that's loud and noisy with distractions. Um, but as soon as you put the noise cancellation in, uh, you can be focused. You can uh, do the task at hand that you have to, in front of you. So... Uh, the reason I, I talk about noise cancellation headphones, you're probably like, what the heck, Adam? Um, but the reality is uh, that sometimes our lives can feel like a coffee shop. With the culture we're in in our society, there's a lot of noise. We live in an age where uh, social media gives us access to thousands of voices at once. And we have the internet where we can be taking in information at such a high pace that we just feel busy, we feel uh, confused, overwhelmed. And sometimes our life might feel like a busy coffee shop where we're trying to get something done, but man, is there a lot of distractions. And uh, I think the application for that is that sometimes in our, in our spiritual lives, uh, we need noise cancellation because in our culture, there's people telling us things we can or can't believe. Uh, where, like I said, we're in an age where there's so much noise, so much voices being poured into our, our minds. And what we just read about Jesus doing when he was tempted by Satan was that whenever a, a temptation of the world came, he, his attention went directly to what was at the center of his heart. And at the center of his heart was the, the word and truth of God. And in our lives, there might be moments where uh, we're tempted by something or, or we're tempted to be distracted or let the voices overwhelm us. Uh, but if we have our, our center of our attention focused on the truth and word of God, we're, we're able to step into those temptations and say, hey, you know what? I, I, my, my focus is rooted in the word and truth of God. I, I know that the world, the culture is telling me to do one thing, but I am going to stay firm in where my attention is. And, and sometimes we just need to use noise cancellation and say, hey, I'm just going to check out. I'm going I'm to put the social media down. I'm going to uh, choose to have a Sunday or a, month or a Friday where I'm just unplugged and away from all the voices. And uh, not only is that, I think, a healthy emotional thing, but a healthy spiritual thing of, of be, having time where we're unplugged, having time where we're um, spending time with friends and family. Uh, so my challenge for all of us is, is as we strive to love God in a culture that tells us to turn to dozens of other things uh, before God, is to be so rooted in his word and in his presence that our attention is fully captured. Because, like I was saying, there's so many things vying for our attention and telling us what to do. If we are to be so rooted in his word and his presence that our attention is fully captured, we're able to live into our culture and not be influenced by it, be surrounded by it, but not be influenced by it, and be in it, but not of it, right? Um, and, and when we do those things, distractions will still come, right? Uh, we're already... Uh, seeing things make us uncomfortable. We're seeing things uh, come into our life to try to distract us or catch our attention. But when we're rooted in God's word and in his presence, we're able to engage our culture that can easily pull our attention away. But when we're rooted in his presence, we're able to engage our culture in a way that honors God, in a way that helps us stay sane. Um, so I want to transition to the next pillar uh, that I believe uh, is a way that we can live out our faith in a culture that is drifting away from God. And the next pillar of keeping your faith in our society is how, love, how we love people. Uh, okay. Hello? Hello? Oh, no. Um, okay, we'll preach from this for a second until 
Can I get a handheld? Can I get a handheld mic? Okay, here we go. All right, so the next pillar of keeping our faith is the society of how we love people. Uh, so I think this one is important, not just because uh, Jesus mentions it in, in the greatest commandment, uh, but we are living in a society where loving somebody who isn't necessarily in our circle is, is a rare thing. Uh, so we have the opportunity to step into a culture that tells us to be divided, to tells us to uh, pick up arms against one another, and we're able to live out our faith in how we love others. And if we want to live out our faith in the world, a large part of that will be done by loving the people around us and in our communities. Uh, a moment from Jesus' ministry comes to mind where Jesus is spending time with his disciples and uh, he says something that gives us an idea of how we love people can be a foundational pillar uh, to how we live out our faith in our culture. And, and I want to go to a, a moment in John 13. And, and in John 13, Jesus says this. He says, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. In, in a culture that pushes us uh, to get what is ours at any cost, they will know we follow Jesus by how we love one another. Uh, when we're faced with choosing who we surround ourselves with, they will know we follow Jesus because how we love one another. And, and we have the opportunity for the gospel of Jesus to be played out in our lives if we're willing to surrender to Jesus and allow his love for us to be reflected onto those around us. And Jesus says, just as I have loved you, just as I have poured out my love onto you, go and do so unto others. Go and love others just as I have loved you. And if we look at that and what Jesus has done for us, guys, that is a heavy, heavy love for somebody to lay their life down for us and, and then say, just as I have loved you, go and love one another. That's a high calling. That is not, uh, hey, I'm going to be nice to this person on, on Sunday when I see them. That is a high calling that, that says, hey, I'm going to walk through your burdens with you. I'm going to walk alongside you. I'm going to be there for you when you're down, when you're up. I'm going to love you because you deserve to be loved, not because you earned it, but just because you deserve to be loved. And... Uh, for us to do this, for us to have that deep love for one another, uh, it helps to know why we do it, right? And, and there's a concept that is a core part of why, why we love people and every single human being. And it's this concept called Imago Dei, and, which is, it's funny because when I was putting my slides in, I realized that Nathan talked about Imago Dei last week while I was at uh, our spring retreat. Uh, so you're getting a double dose of Imago Dei. Um, so... Enjoy your Imago Day two weeks in a row. Uh, but Imago Day, if you were here or you weren't here, it's simply a Latin phrase for image of God. And it, it goes back to the story of creation in Genesis where God instilled within each and every person uh, the image of God in, in each and every one of us, every person we encounter on the streets, every person we encounter 15 years from now, every single person has the image of God instilled within them. Not because they earned it, not because they, they did the right thing, but because God created them. And when we see this, we're able to allow our opinions and judgments to be thrown aside uh, as the love of Jesus poured out for you and for me is then reflected onto every person we encounter. Not because uh, we need to check off a box of loving somebody, but because God created them and they deserve to be loved. And, and the powerful thing about this kind of love is that it values each person as God's creation. And, and we're reminded that what we have in common, uh, the image of God that is instilled within each and every one of us is far greater than any difference, any division that could come up among us. And, and we're reminded that no matter how much our culture or our world tries to turn us against each other or, or make us feel like uh, we have to fight or quarrel, um, we're reminded that in those instances, in those instances where uh, we're told to turn against each other, that we have access to abundant life. We have access to abundant life as one's that God created in his own image. And that goes for every single person we've met, we have known right now, or that we will ever meet in the future. And when we step out on faith and love those around us, it's a testament to the transformation that God has in our own hearts. Because when we choose to love with no prerequisites, 
Uh, we, we are stepping into the life that God has led each of us into. And when we choose to say, hey, I'm not going to make you check off these boxes before I love you. I'm not going to make sure you have these prereqs checked out before I step into a, a relationship of loving you. We're reflecting the love that Jesus has poured out for us onto those around us. And that is a testament to the power of Jesus transforming our life. And, and there's so many ways in your life that uh, you could live out your faith in a culture by simply being present, by simply being present with those around you and loving those in your circles and in your communities and anyone that you ever cross paths with. Because we live in a, a society where uh, being present with someone is, is a rarity. Uh, we live in a society where everything's quick paced. Everything's flying by in the blink of a moment. And if we take the time to be present with somebody, to say, hey, you're worth my time. You're worth my, my, my energy and, and giving you my presence. Not that our presence is like some crazy thing, but just being present with somebody can change a life. And the pillar of, of loving somebody as we live out our faith in this world, in a society that might be drifting away from God, the pillar of loving somebody and, and then loving God, as we first talked about, ties directly into the third pillar that I want to look at today. And, and the third pillar, like I said at the beginning, is making disciples. And as we love God and we love others, uh, we're led by Jesus uh, through his great commission to disciple all people. And the great commission, uh, if you're unfamiliar with it, it was just Jesus' last instruction and in sending out of his followers as he was leaving earth. And he says, uh, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And, and he gives us the challenge to go, to build relationships, to lead those people who don't yet know Jesus into relationship with him. And, and when we love God and are in relationship with Jesus, we're drawn to love those around us. And uh, when we love God and people, we're, we want everyone around us to know the goodness of God. We're drawn to make disciples. And because this relationship, our vertical relationship, makes us love these relationships, and then we're able to say, hey, Jesus changed my life. Jesus took me from being a broken person who needed saving and, and, and brought light into the darkness and allowed me to be transformed, and he can do it for you too. And, and that's what the beginning of a process of discipleship even looks like. Um, so I think in a lot of Christian circles, uh, maybe you've seen this, maybe you haven't, is that disciples, making disciples can seem like such a daunting and huge task. You're like, how in the world am I supposed to make disciples? Like, I'm just trying to figure out what I'm going to eat for dinner tonight. Um, and, and it can be daunting. Uh, but the thing that made it so simple to me, the thing that broke it down and made it simple for me is that none of the power is expected to come from us. None of the power when making disciples ex is expected to come from us. I can't save somebody's life. I can't bring salvation to somebody's life. Nathan can't bring salvation to somebody's life. None of us can save anybody. Only Jesus can do that. And our calling to make disciples doesn't have to do with the salvation. It has to do with being a signpost that says, hey, I, I'm just somebody else who needed transformed and have my thoughts, my mind focused on Jesus. And we're able to step alongside somebody and show them what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. And we're never the ones that are bringing the transformation in their life. Only Jesus can do that. And almost all the stories and testimonies I've heard is not somebody saying, oh, there was this person who was so perfect in my life and uh, they were so perfect that I decided to follow Jesus. No, almost every testimony you'll hear goes something like, there was a Jesus follower who, who took the time to see me and walk alongside me, and then the power of Jesus transformed me. So really what our call is, when we're, we're called to make disciples, is to be present and point others into the presence of God. Because at the end of the day, we can't save anyone. Only Jesus can do that. And we have the privilege to be invited by Jesus into uh, bringing his creation in, into relationship with him. And the most powerful way for you and I to be a disciple in the 21st century is to really be present with somebody. Let your love for them be expressed through your actions. And say, hey, I love you enough to stand by you, to walk alongside you, and point you into the presence of God. 
in, in our friendships, in our communities, and uh, in our families, we have the opportunity to walk alongside those who are asking questions about Jesus and point them in the right direction. And we point them in the right direction because we aren't the destination. We aren't the destination. We're only a signpost pointing to Jesus. If we were the destination, that would, if I was the destination for somebody coming to Jesus, that would be a pretty big letdown because I am a broken person who makes mistakes. But instead, there's joy and triumph because when we are walking alongside someone and inviting them to be a disciple of Jesus, we get to say, hey, I, I don't have it all together. I'm broken just like everybody else. I, I need Jesus in my life, and I, I believe that he can transform your life as well. And when we do that, we see someone's humanity. We, we honor them, and we say, hey, you're no worse than I am. We are all in this together, and let me point you into the presence of God that's changed my life. And when Jesus is the destination and we're making disciples, all we're simply doing is entering into a relationship with, with someone on a level playing field and, and saying, hey, I realize I can't do this all on my own. A while ago, I realized that I'm not going to be able to get through this life all on my own, that I'm in the need of a savior. And in our culture today, uh, where everything is grab and go, right, and everything is uh, self-seeking, we as the church, we have the pivotal opportunity to step into a society that's obsessed with fast and turn around and quick satisfaction and say, hey, we believe as followers of Jesus that there is transforming power in the spirit of God, in Jesus, and we are committed to being carriers of love, carriers of peace, and carriers of truth. And what I don't want to miss, what I don't want us to miss is that in discipleship, we are committed to a movement not a moment. When we, when we receive salvation in Jesus, it's, it starts in a moment, but it doesn't end in a moment. It's a movement that we continue in for the entirety of our lives. And we're invited to, to not only receive Jesus in a moment, but let our lives be transformed for years to come. And, and when we disciple someone or, or we invite someone to be a disciple of Jesus, we're not asking them to, to say a singular prayer and walk away. We're asking them to join a movement that is the people of God on earth, spreading love, peace, justice in all areas of life. And, and I strongly believe, I so strongly believe that God is still in the business of bringing his wandering children into his presence. And I believe the church, we as the church, have the calling and opportunity to step into Jesus' great commission as we make disciples of people from all different backgrounds, all different ages, all different socioeconomic levels, and different nations. And so, as, as I begin to wrap up, band, you can, you can make your way up here, but I want to give us the reminder that as people committed to love God, love others, and make disciples, we're called to be engaged in our culture, not to withdraw from it, and have people who believe, look, and talk different than us in our circles, and we're called to notice our culture and society, and see the ways that uh, we're we're tempted to tell ourselves what we need, what we don't need, but at the end of the day, all we need is surrender to Jesus. And we can be a people as the church who humbly engage conversations with those who do not know Jesus, who those are, are thinking that the things of this world are enough. We can humbly engage those conversations with grace and truth so that we could encounter the Spirit of God transforming not just our heart, but those around us. And we have the opportunity to receive true and eternal life through being reconciled to the Father through Jesus and the sacrifice he made for you and me. So today, whether you feel like those three pillars of loving God, loving others, and making disciples is, is at the center of your life, or you're like, I just am still figuring all this stuff out. I want you to know that Jesus is always there for you, whether you're at the beginning of the journey or you've been on it for a while. Jesus is always there for you, and, and he invites you to be a part of his story in a way in which you live and engage with people in your workplaces, your homes, your community, in a way that honors God and draws people and points people to Jesus. And what I'll leave you with today is this. God is always in control. So no matter how chaotic or disheartening our world or culture may get, no matter how disheartening our world or culture may get, there is hope found in Jesus who offers us an opportunity to not only be in God's presence for eternity, but to find deep and re rich meaning in our lives each and every day. Let's pray. 
God, thank you for uh, your word. Thank you for allowing us to uh, step into your presence each and every day. I, I pray that you would continue to show us how, as the church body, Universal could, could not disengage from our culture, God, but engage our culture and be a voice of, of peace and love and, and justice and truth, God. I pray that you would allow us to be transformed, not only so we may be secluded and, and disengaged, God, but so we may engage the people around us in loving conversations as we love God, love people, and make disciples. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.